I can tell you that it was much easier for me to adjust to go from being very car-centric to being car-free than the other way around when I moved from Europe to the US. Uh, that was much more different change uh, to all of a sudden become dependent on automobile. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, December 3rd, 2021, and this is episode number 101, the first episode of season three, as I have arbitrarily decided that each season shall have 50 episodes. And in this first episode of season three, I'm delighted to share my conversation with Dr. Natalia Barber, Assistant Professor of Transport and Energy at TU Delft in the Netherlands. I discovered Natalia because of her uplifting, inspirational, and authentic reflections that she shares daily on Twitter. She has a fabulous story to tell. But before we roll into all of that, please allow me a brief moment to say that this episode is once again being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Thank you so much, folks. As I head into season three here, please know that your support means so much to me, and I couldn't do this without you. If you too would like to contribute, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. Now, I also like mentioning that there are a few other ways that you can help support my efforts that don't involve money. The first, if you're listening to this episode, is to simply subscribe to the audio podcast on your preferred platform. The second, if you're watching the episode on YouTube, is to subscribe to the Active Towns channel. And be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll get a reminder when I post new videos, which is typically about one per week. And finally, please help me to spread the word about the Active Towns initiative and this episode by sharing it with anyone you think might be interested in or could benefit from this content. Thank you also very much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get rolling with this conversation with Dr. Natalia Barber. This is episode number 101 featuring Dr. Natalia Barber, and she is an assistant professor at TU Delft in the Netherlands, one of my favorite cities. Natalia, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much, John, for having me. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. What I'd love to have you do to get us started is just give us a little bit of a background. T tell us who you are and, uh, and briefly how the heck you ended up in Delft of all places. Oh, it's quite a story that we definitely do not have the time to get into, but I'm going to try to give a a minute recap of how I ended up in Delft. Uh, but starting from the very, very early age, I was born in Poland um, and I grew up in a small Polish town that I describe it as the place that when you're growing up, you're dying to leave. But then when you are kind of grown up, you're dying to come back to. It's less than 30,000 people and you define your distance in walking. So if you have to drive somewhere 30 minutes, you're probably 10 villages away. And you're like, oh, I went way too far. And I spent in that little town probably my entire life until I had to move out to college. And I moved to a bigger city where I studied physics. And then right after I graduated with my undergraduate degree, I came to the U.S. And that's almost a decade and a half um, in the U.S. where I got my master's in transportation, my Ph.D. in transportation. I did my postdoc at MIT in transportation, um, more focusing on urban uh, mobility and, and urban design and now I'm at TU Delft. And how that happened, I was walking around European career fair and I was browsing universities and I was like, wow, maybe an adventure for the next part of my life. And that's how I got connected to TU Delft. I had first interview in Boston and then they forwarded my CV to some of the professors at TU Delft and then the rest is history. 
It took seven interviews and multiple months. Um, as a fan fact, I had to give a lecture at five in the morning. Uh, that went interestingly, uh, but it turned out it wasn't as bad as I thought. That's fantastic. Now, as I understand, you had never even visited Delft, uh, you know, prior to needing to, to, to make the move and, and get there. Is that correct? It is. I guess I forgot to mention that part. Uh, when I was interviewing, we were in the middle of Corona virus pandemic and everything was on lockdown. So traveling to Delft was not an option. Uh, so I went to Amsterdam when I was 21, maybe. And that was the only time, maybe there was one more, but it was a really long time ago. I visited the Netherlands. So moving to a foreign country, to a new city in the middle of the pandemic uh, was quite a challenge um, and took some serious bravery on my family's part to be like, yeah, we're going to Delft and we're just going to figure it out. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, now you mentioned the family, so it's not just you. I mean, that the, it was even bigger decision and an even bigger move because it was. It's not just you. Tell us a little bit about the family. Yeah, so I got two little girls, uh, six oh, and yeah. eleven. When I approached them to uh, ask them, of course, I talked to my partner, so he was on board, and then the kids. So when we approached the kids, they were like what? Where is that? And I remember the story when we were discussing moving and my younger one said, do they have school in the Netherlands? And it was so adorable because she couldn't really get Netherlands uh, and she called it Neverland and it kind of stick around, uh, stuck around our house. Uh, so the kids were surprised um, and my partner was really supportive because he was like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Tier Delft is such an amazing uh, university. And going back to our European youths, roots was another, um, I would say, benefit for our family. And since then, the girls have been in 70% Dutch school. So I would assume that their Dutch is a little bit better than mine at this point. Uh, they made friends. On the first day, they each made two friends and they biked to school. Uh, and we all made it. I think the adults were a little bit more nervous, but... Um, I think it turned out to be a really good experience for the entire family. If anything, it brought us more together. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to actually pull up a, a couple of images that you sent my way from uh, from from your your original homeland from from Poland. So uh, on the uh, the iPad here uh, now is this the the this is the the fountain the image from from your original uh, village? Is that correct? Yes, that's the main square, you know, in all European cities, it's all about the main square. Uh, so that's how they redid it. And now they lit it up with lights. And that's where if there is an event, that's where people go and gather. And you have to remember, the city is less than 30,000 people. So everyone knows everyone. Right. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And so you said that it, it's mostly, you know, it's a smaller city. It's mostly walkable. Now, it, was it bikeable too? Was were, was biking a, a common theme in, in this village? Not when I was growing up. Um, so as kids, we were biking, but it was more for fun to go to friend's house, but it was never a mode of transportation. What now I am looking at when I, every time I go and visit, because uh, Poland joined EU years ago um, and they have common goals, we got a lot of investment from the EU to develop bike lanes. And you ha you can see the signs even in my little town where I come from that these projects were aiming to reduce CO2 from transportation. And as you know, that's a huge right. sector that contributes to global warming. And now as years go by, my little town, like believe it or not, that little 27,000 27, people town um, has bike sharing program. and. The seats for kids are actually, uh, the bikes has have seats for the kids. So if you have a small child and you want to use bike sharing, you can use it. Um, on top of that, all the buses are electric and free. So the city has been really, really transforming into bikeable and uh, more sustainable. Right, right. Fantastic. And the other neat thing that you told me about the city is this picture. Tell, tell us about this. 
So in Polish, it's called Bifurkacja, and I'm sure no one knows about it. And this is actually a very nice looking picture because when you go and see it in the real life, you're like, oh, that's what it's about. It's really not that great looking. But, okay, fun fact. Um, my city is one of the very few cities in the world that rivers cross. And now there's a controversy. Uh, no one knows whether it's what, it was man-made or it was natural. Uh, maybe there's some literature. If any one of the listeners wants to look into it, I would love to know uh, what you find. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, cr river crossing. Very rare, apparently. Very rare. <laughs> Two rivers cross in the woods. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's really really fascinating. That now through the this lens that you have now that you 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 went away you you went you went to one of the the big city there in Poland and got the undergraduate degree, but then you immediately went and, and worked on your master's uh, in of all places Alabama. Talk about cultural shock. <laughs> so that was that was fascinating. So talk about that that transition because you you were Alabama, then Florida, and then worked on some postdoc stuff uh, with MIT. And I have some questions that'll hold for you about MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, until a little bit. But talk about that that that's that you know sort of shift that you went through kind of remember back to what that was like going from poland to alabama to florida yes that's oh now it brings a lot of memories uh, i actually spent a few years in new jersey in between i was working okay. on writing and polishing my language and then i was following my partner who was a resident and then a fellow. So that's why we had to move a lot. And uh, they had transportation program. And, you know, how we define our path is uh, there are a lot of forces that are playing a role. And I think that was one of these moments that I wasn't really sure what to pursue, but I was always interested in transportation and how people move around and how much value good transportation systems have that when I was choosing a graduate program, I was like, oh, transportation sounds good. Oh, little I knew what kind of a journey I'm embarking on. And I remember the adjustment to first American University. That was huge. There's so many, I made so many mistakes. I had so many lessons to learn, um, a cultural shock from that, as well as from transportation. So I would imagine in Birmingham, there would be a very robust downtown where you go and there's a lot of people and you can feel the liveliness. And then I learned about urban sprawl and I was like, what's going on here? There's no one walking. Um, and there was just very quiet, uh, relatively quiet place. Although it's a very, very large city that the downtown is not as lively as I would expect. So adjusting to that driving and basically, if I wanted to go get coffee, I had to drive. If I wanted to go to the gym, I had to drive. Um, although I did go through biking period in Alabama. It was hot and I was wearing heels, but I still did it anyway uh, because I lived about um, a mile and a half from the university. So I would bike to, to classes, but that was it. Um, the car culture took over me very, very quickly. Yeah, it's... Um very, very sad in, in many ways how that kind of happens. But then again, in the reverse, it is as you experienced when you made the move to the Netherlands and, and you made it, the move to Delft, uh, you, you know, you, you just, uh, you know, as humans, we do adapt to our surroundings. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the human behavior side and what infrastructure and, and how we respond to infrastructure uh, a little bit later. But let's talk a little bit about that transition then. So then you were in, in South Florida, correct? Yes. Okay. So then you're in South Florida and you're working on your, your, your doctorate. At that point in time, um, are you really starting to hone in on uh, the, your future area of study? And we'll, we'll talk about your research interests in, in just a little bit. But was that really forming while you were in Florida? Yes, those were my, that's where I was picking up what fascinates me. And I found that a lot of our transportation behavior is rooted in psychology, is rooted in our culture. And 
is very much dependent on the infrastructure. So then I started to uh, be curious about how can I use the statistical methods to analyze behavior. And there was already a lot of work done, but I tried to find another opportunity in shared mobility. And that kind of fascinated me because we're running out of space. We're not utilizing our resources properly because there's so much unused capacity that someone else could use. And that's what triggered my interest. And that's the direction I went into uh, during my PhD. And I'm, that's what I'm currently studying as well. Fantastic. Now, I know that uh, once you were working on your postdoctoral stuff with, uh, with MIT, uh, you started really honing in on some shared mobility stuff and, and, and all of that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the work that you did uh, in that arena in, a, in just a moment. But what I really am curious about is because I know Cambridge fairly well, did you get to spend some time in Cambridge? Yes, the first, I would say, nine, 10 months, uh, that was before we went on a lockdown. I was commuting back and forth. And uh, wow, that we can definitely talk about the biking behavior because that's uh, very brave. Those are very brave people who bike in Boston. And if anyone from Boston listens and you're a biker, I mean, you have my full, full admiration. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it's it's d- a definitely a different rhythm. And I had Kara Siderman on the uh, the podcast a few weeks ago, and uh, we talked a little bit about how um, Cambridge as a city uh, just across the river from Boston is really working hard to try to transform their environment and, and, and get it to become more bicycle and, and walkable friendly. And uh, they're they're making progress. And in fact, it's from a North American perspective, it's one of the best places to to be able to walk and bike to meaningful destinations, uh, depending on where you're at. But I know what you mean because it, it can be a, a little bit harrowing in in some ways because on those streets where there isn't protected and separated infrastructure, uh, you're you're sort of left to duke it out with. Uh, a lot of fast moving traffic. And so it's a challenge. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is it definitely was a step in the right direction towards what you ended up experiencing um, by making the move to the to the Netherlands, because you at least had a, a chance to experience a North American city where the the mode share, the, the number of people who are walking and biking to meaningful uh, destinations and for meaningful trips are in fact getting around through something other than the single occupancy vehicle. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, so l- let's talk a little bit about that work that you were actually actually doing during that postdoc. And I think it really uh, also sort of solidified where you're, what you're doing now and, 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 you know, the thought process. And then we'll get into some of your research interests that you, that you currently have at the, at TU Delft. Uh, Sure. And during my uh, postdoc, I was developing a course, I was leading uh, a course development for digital platform edX and it was very nice because i got to collaborate with a lot of transportation individuals and experts and academics from multiple continents and we were able to develop um, over 10 week curriculum that is currently being updated and you can find the course on on edX it's called leveraging urban mobility disruptions to create better cities uh, so the course is very much up and running and we focused every week was a different focus. So we did have behavioral focus. We did have um, a lot of about equity, land use and all the transportation topics. And um, that was a very steep learning curve for me from many different perspectives, not only uh, learning more about transportation, but also from that collaboration perspective, seeing different points of view and seeing how broad impact transportation field really has on our lives. And um, yeah, and going back to Cambridge, that biking, I was always, where I lived, I could not make it to Cambridge by bike, but I was very envious of the people who were able to bike. And I would always see their uh, helmets and their bike gear at MIT. And um, I could definitely see that the city was changing and going in that right direction. And I think, is, is this the class? I think I just pulled it up here. Yes, that's the class. Okay, fantastic. And it's, and it's free. Yes, 
it's Dude, free fantastic. um oh unless you're pursuing a certificate so the, the okay. class you can take i think it runs about once a year right. um and you can always pick and choose which modules you're interested in so it's a really nice way to uh, grasp what mobility is about now in a relatively quick way Wow, that is, that is so cool. Now, was this one of the the first uh, you know classes of this type that you were uh, able to uh, to create? Yes, although I took more of a, a administrator role in this class, I was involved in content creation and recordings, but I was more behind the scenes. Uh, so that gave me a really good experience of how this production what, what has to play a role for that production to see the sunlight. Uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm taking a completely different role and I'm recording two weeks on transportation and climate change that will launch in January, uh, where I'm actually standing in front of the camera a little more and teaching about uh, transportation sector mitigation in, in terms of emissions, uh, which is turning out to be my other passion, passion that I picked up um, at MIT. Wow, so this is this is so so cool to, to hear your story, and uh, we're we're going to get into one of the aspects of of this story that I love so much, and the reason why I reached out to you, uh, I discovered you via Twitter because you were you know you were continuing to tweet out some really cool stuff that uh, really hones in on what I try to do with Active Towns, which is trying to humanize uh, you know our built environment and, and humanize uh, active mobility and, and trying to talk about, you know, you know, the, the things that matter and, and specifically what I mean by that is, uh, you know, how every, how it impacts our everyday life and our everyday living. Uh, but before we queue up some of the, the conversations and some of the photos that, that you have shared out on Twitter, I want to show uh, this, this particular photo because this is great. This is you, uh, you know, at the TU Delft sign, <laughs> which I know quite well because I spent a fair amount of time uh, there at, uh, at the university. And in fact, I, uh, one of their famous uh, intersections there that has just an amazing number of, of, of people riding bikes to classes and throughout town, the, you know, that area, uh, I was able to produce a video for. It's one of my most popular videos that I've ever produced out on the YouTube channel. So this is you, yay! <laughs> Fantastic. So talk a little bit about that that side of it, and then we'll 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 talk a little bit more about the side of uh, what it was like to make that cultural shift. So uh, what are you doing at the university, and and what are some of your main uh, main goals and objectives from a research pr perspective, and also from an instruction perspective? Yeah, the, the photo, back to the photo, that was the first time I made it onto U Delft campus after working remotely for over six months, I believe. Um, oh, that's and, right. That's yeah. right. Because you, 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 you actually started, but because of the pandemic, you hadn't yet stepped foot on campus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so in, in addition to 5 a.m. interview, I had ten, I had 2 a.m. class I was teaching. Um, I was <laughs> towards the end, 6 a.m. I don't think I made much sense, but I powered through. And that was a very special moment because it was like, oh, I made it. This is happening. Because, you know, while you're still sitting in your house in Florida and you're just sometimes get up a little earlier, it didn't really feel real. But I right. saw the campus and I smelled uh, the air and I felt how crisp it was. I was like, wow, this is happening. Um, and I got my keys uh, from to my office and then the mm -hmm. work really started to pick up. Again, little I knew uh, when you start as a brand new assistant professor, you have all these ideas and then you realize that you have only 24 hours to right. uh, yeah. <laughs> get it all going. And currently at TU Delft, I'm involved in a lot of things, as all the early career junior professors are. So I'm teaching courses on transportation systems, uh, climate change mitigation. I do research uh, in travel behavior. Uh, then, you know, you have the service hours where you serve on committees and then you contribute to the university. And one of my 
biggest goals um, aside from pretty much anything, just more of a personal goal is that that move was really, really scary. So I wanted to publicly share my journey in case anyone ever has a dream and they're just afraid to go for it. I, I did go for it. I probably didn't sleep a few nights before I went for it, but I did go for it. And it turned out it brought so many um, surprising um, elements in my life that I'm really enjoying right now. And part of it is my biking. When I moved here, I had no car. Uh, the furniture were somewhere in the Atlantic and you didn't know where the grocery store was. So what did I do? I just went and got a bike and got two little bags. I'm like, okay, I got to feed the kids. Um, so my husband did the same. So we have four bags and then the kids have the little uh, seats with the, the holders and we just made it work. Um, and that's pretty much the story. And we're, I feel like we're still trying to make it work and it gets easier every time. And you're like, oh, this is my life. I just got to figure it out how to get the groceries back, how to do the recycle. And we have to talk about the recycling, uh, how we take all our boxes on our bikes. Uh, so part of my, to answer your question, part of my goal is to share my journey. And, and the second part is to uh, share that being car free or just very rarely using a car, if there is a supportive infrastructure and you may have children, um, it's, or you may, there are young people, older people, people with disabilities on that bike path because it's protected. Uh, it's a way of life and it's actually pretty enjoyable. Right, right. Speaking of enjoyable, when I see this photo, I see joy. <laughs> you know, it's like, yay, we we're, we're going. And you mentioned it earlier. You, you mentioned the fact that the kids, you know, they're, they're pretty resilient. Uh, I can see, you know, I think that's her bike in the, in the bottom, bottom right uh, corner there. Uh, it's like, yeah, they can ad adapt and adjust so quickly. And here, of course, is your quintessential, uh, you know, Netherlands shot. You know, this is your 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 shot of the beautiful bikes uh, on one of the bridges with the flowers. You see these all around uh, the Netherlands, whether you're in Utrecht or if you're over in, in Amsterdam, and of course, uh, in, around the, the beautiful areas there in Delft. Um, so let's let's talk about that. You mean you, you it's that journey that you were just talking about and the reason why you want to share that. And that's what I noticed out on your Twitter feed was starting to see not only the beautiful pictures, but also some other reflections about the relevance of of what this means for for you and for everybody else. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so once I got to experience the car-free life, I realized that my kids were a little bit, I, would, I don't want to say happier, but more at ease because they get to use all the kids' energy and a bike back and forth from school. Another, uh, oh, this is my bike with the coffee holder and my GPS because <laughs> yes, uh, it's, I, I constructed this design by myself out of desperation. So then I ha can have coffee and see where I'm going because it's illegal to use a phone. So I got to obey the law. Right. Um, and I, I, I share on my Twitter the things that I am learning myself. It's in a way I'm living my own research because I am cons constantly changing my own behavior. And uh, some of the things that surprised me the most is how independent children are. I see those little, I don't know, they're three, four, they don't even ride a bike yet, and they are pushing uh, themselves on the psychopath to school. They may be blocking a couple bikers behind them, but everyone is very patient. Um, another thing I've noticed is there's no road rage on the psychopath. Uh, there may yeah, be some, yeah. you know, uh, size or um, some eye rolls, but usually everyone is very chilled. So there has to be, right. and the res research has shown that there is a relationship between our health and activity. And that's been discovered years ago. And I think that bikers are just happy people. Um, so yeah, those are my two girls on day one of school. We went slowly um, so they can get comfortable. And a lot of kids bike or walk to school by themselves, which that's not something that you see 
um, in the U.S. And that helps the parents to be a little bit more free because you spend less time on carpool. Uh, you don't have to drive the kids back and forth and they do it themselves. And if they're older enough, like my um, 11-year-old, she can go by herself right now. So the freedom, right. absolutely. And for adults, there's no better way than to leave a meeting. And instead of getting into the car, not being happy about biking in the rain, but doing it anyway, and then getting home. And it's like the whole energy, whether it's positive or negative, is just washed over you. And you start right. fresh when you enter the door, which is like cleansing in a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pull up a, a, a Twitter, uh, a, a recent uh, a Twitter post that you had here. So let's pull pull this one up here. So this was this was actually just from like 20 hours ago that that you had posted this and and it, it's talk a little bit about this reflection that you had in in, in this particular post. I remember it was inspired by my good friend from Tampa and we connected and uh, she was a fitness instructor and she said, you know, Natalia, I didn't realize how tired I really was until I stopped. And then last night I was reflecting on that and I'm like, yeah, it's so true. Sometimes we don't realize how energy consuming something is until we stop. And I found a similar thing to happen with our auto uh, dependence. Uh, we, we're stuck in traffic and we think, um, I don't want to say we, but uh, it makes no sense, but we do it anyway. And I did it. So I'm not, I'm not above it. I would be right. stuck in traffic and I would definitely drive to places because I didn't find a self safer uh, alternative. And now that I stopped, I can see how much more freedom I have. I don't have to leave early to find a parking spot. I remember having to leave an hour and a half early to beat the traffic to get to my destination. Um, so that gives you freedom, financial freedom. Um, and it's also beautiful to see different, you know how you adjust your vehicle for your needs inside. You may have uh, things that you do for leisure or any equipment that you need. Uh, here you can see all these bikes, and I'm sure that you've been to Delft, so you know what I'm referring to. Everyone can adjust their bicycle, whether it's a cargo bike or it uh, has a kid seat or extra storage or both. Uh, or GPS holder, you can see how everyone adjusts those features to their individual needs. However, it costs a fraction of the price. And I felt like you will not discover it until you really try it. And then there's a possibility that that freedom can be felt when you stop driving, at least how it happened for me. Yeah, but Natalia, I mean, come on, get real. W what happens if you're if you're biking and and you you get a flat tire? Oh, oh, wait. Like two hours ago, you had a flat tire. <laughs> two hours ago, so I left from. Uh, we had class presentations, and I left, and I was going to my office, and then all of a sudden, I hear, Psh, and I'm like, no. And I don't know how that happens. It's still a mystery. It went completely flat. Um, it normally, happens. I would have to, yeah. <laughs> So I just decided to ride my optimism and walked my bike home. It turned out to just be nothing. It's kind of the vent unscrewed. I don't know. Um, and then I realized, and that's why I tweeted it, This the same thing happened to us once on a highway. It was between New York and New Jersey, and it was snowing in January. And we ended up questioning our own mortality as I mentioned right. in this tweet, because once, once you're stuck there and you're either changing the tire or waiting for uh, some service, I think everyone questions their own mortality under that bridge in the winter. And that's not the case if you have short commute and you do it by bike. There's a different alternative. You have at yeah. least alternatives. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. And, you know, and I love the fact that you were able to pivot with that and, you know, turn it into a positive and say, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't get there as get home as quickly as I would have otherwise, but it was a nice walk. So there you go. So, and, and we all know that we end up appreciating things, um, at when we're traveling at different mo our, our various mobility modes, we experience them in a different way. So we experience our city in a much more intimate way, in a different way, uh, when we're biking versus when we're in a car, or even for that matter, when we're in a train. Um, 
And then you also, you, your level of appreciation for your environment is even more acute when you're walking because you're going just that little bit more, uh, you know, slowly and you're really able to experience it at, at a different finite ingrained level and be able to appreciate, you know, what's going on. Even though traveling by bike, Dutch style, traveling by bike isn't that fast. It's certainly, you know, one, one, you know, 100%, maybe 200%, maybe 300% faster than what we would be, you know, when we are walking. So anyways, it's, it's nice to appreciate that too. And, and interestingly enough, uh, we had this conversation, I had this conversation with Chris and Melissa Bruntlett, who I believe you know, and uh, they talked about the fact that many of their destinations and many of their trips around the city of Delft are so short that it, it's a more natural walk than it is a, a a bike. And so getting back to, you know, the 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 term that you used earlier to describe your original village that you grew up in in Poland, you know, walkable, uh, you know, some of those trips are are much more pleasant, you know, as a walking trip. So yeah. Have you it, noticed that? Yes. Have you been no- noticing walking to many destinations once you made that move? Uh, yes, to many things. Uh, we walk to get ice cream with our kids all the time. Uh, and it just is so nice to be able to walk, get your steps in. Uh, I used to be in a step competition. I have to put on my iWatch back, but I would be winning. Oh, I would be crushing everyone right now. Oh, speaking of that, that's something probably on my to-do list uh, to join the competition because we walk so much. And uh, you're right, the city can be experienced from completely different dimension. We can explore all the little corners and all the little cute shops. And it actually is good for the city because we are stopping at places that we wouldn't stop anyway. Um, if I, if we wouldn't stop if we were driving. So I, I find that very surprising that every time I walk to the same destination, we take a different route and we always discover uh, cute little things around the city of Delft. We're still in the exploratory phase. We, we've been here just for a few months. Let's yeah, see how yeah. it goes in six months to a year. Maybe I will be better than a Google map. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the one of the things that uh, Chris and Melissa and I were talking about when I was visiting them, along with my partner, Laura, uh, back in 2019, was wanting to uh, capture the the specialness of uh, the environment that they found themselves in. Uh, they were the same the same way in in many senses that they actually committed to moving to Delft before ever having visited Delft. They had visited other cities throughout the Netherlands, but they had never actually been to Delft, and so they made that decision. So it was a wonderful surprise for them. Uh, we ended up connecting with them in 2019 in the fall after they had been there for a little while, but they already started to feel like they were becoming fish in water and it wasn't, it was, it was, they were starting to take things for granted. And so that specialness and newness is something that they tried to capture in their latest book, uh, Curbing Traffic. And, and, and I think that's important. Um, I just pulled up another thing here on the iPad that I'm going to uh, pull up. Now, this is the uh, event that you are going to be doing in, in just next, this coming week. We're, we're actually recording this on uh, October 28th. It's not going to be broadcast. So those of you who are watching this right now, it's not going to be broadcast until the end of November. But this is a really special event that I want you to talk about. And hopefully it will be recorded so that people can can access that. And we'll build the link into the show notes for this uh, this episode, both the video version and also the audio version. So let, let's pull this up and have you uh, talk about this particular event that you're going to be involved with? Uh, yes. So I will be speaking in virtual Boston, which is always for me a great pleasure to be back in Boston, even if it's virtually. Um, and the event is organized by uh, WTS and um, American Planning Association. And we will be discussing women on the move in the context of mobility for all. And it's particularly important because a lot of um, studies who come out start to notice that uh, women in particular or individuals uh, who have care activities or are primary caregivers. Um, so the typical um, stereotype, stereotype 
very um, old fashioned uh, gender division roles have different transportation needs and use transportation system differently. Uh, however, transportation systems often don't support uh, those types of trips like trip chaining. And it's been found that um, a lot of women in particular, in particularly do uh, a lot of trips in between their primary and their final destination. Like they leave the house, they go to the daycare, they go to the grocery store. Um, and there is a huge division in how transportation system is being experienced. And another example is mobility at night, how we experience uh, the same transit system at night. Um, and New York uh, University uh, did research and they called it pink tax, meaning women pay the same nominal value for transportation, but they have completely different experiences. So from my perspective, I'll be looking at shared mobility adoption. So in my research, when I collect data, social demographic data, and I uh, run econometric model on it, I can identify which groups of people behave in a certain way. For example, in technology adoption, I found that uh, people who um, are most afraid of safety in context of shared autonomous vehicles uh, are the majority of the group. And then it's a reliability and privacy. And also when I run the models, I find that uh, men tend to worry least about safety. So how we're approaching the transition and how we are building these new technologies or even uh, modes like bike sharing, again, I found that men are more likely to be regular users of bike sharing uh, or even peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. Women are less likely to give their vehicle to a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing fleet and that takes away that economic uh, opportunity to make money. So all these emerging modes, if we assume that it's one size fits all, they'll carry over the same problems that we already have. And in this seminar, we will be addressing those issues um, and speaking up about different needs for different groups. Fantastic. And yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that we have the, that link to the recording so that you all can go back in time and, uh, and see what was, I'm sure, just an amazing uh, event. And that it, it's so encouraging to see that. I'm going to pull up your website and, um, and, and literally, uh, I just want to scroll down your website just a little bit and, 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 and do this. The reason why I want to do this is because now I, you're making me nervous. No, it's cool. I, I, it's, this is really good. I mean, I, it's, it's a, it's a fun website. It, it's, it's great when I run into professors that have uh, nice, uh, you know, well done websites like this, but what I love about this, and I'm going to scroll this uh, to the research uh, interests. And I had mentioned it a couple of different times. And uh, again, as a behaviorist, as somebody who's been working for the past 30 years to try to encourage people to live healthier, active lives, and then really focusing the last 15 years on the built environment and how our built environment really inf influences and impacts our ability to li live a healthy, active lifestyle, uh, you're, you're definitely, uh, you know, your interests are, are right up my alley in so many different ways. So you've got it sort of uh, identified into three different areas here. You you did just mention a, a little bit the, the third area here is you also aim to study transportation, new mobility, and energy trans, transition through the lens of social justice and equity. So that's exactly what you were just talking about. Uh, yes, and uh, now that the new energy sources are being studied like hydrogen for mobility, electrification. I think it provides a huge opportunity to learn from the past uh, before these technologies fully mature and apply the lessons that we have and develop these new systems moving forward. Yeah. Now, you also mentioned here in the second paragraph of, of the policies. Talk a little bit more and expand a little bit about what you mean by the policies that would account for the, both the behavioral and the social framework. Well, one of them I remember uh, studying um, pricing. And I was looking at different pricing schemes of different, it was U.S. universities, and one of the universities uh, one of the universities had pricing on their campus. 
it's very trivial. It's just one campus out of the million. So um, probably shouldn't be a big deal. But I was like, oh, no, this this is unacceptable. So, of course, I tweeted about it, but that was a really long time ago. Uh, maybe I should retweet. And they had the pricing. For example, uh, a parking scooter in a wrong place, that would uh, be a fine of a range of $70, $80. no. 150, sorry, $150. That was, okay. yeah, so $150 for parking the scooter in the wrong place. But for aggressive driving was 70, half. And you can literally speed through campus and almost kill someone. But right. God forbid you put that scooter in the wrong place, which I'm right. not taking away from the right placing of the scooters. But, and unfortunately, there is a but and not or or end. There is a but because the impact that the speed of the car has on the people around it and the uh, parked scooter in the wrong place, we can't compare these two impacts. So that's one of those policies that actually promotes um, fast and unsafe driving and speeding because the fine is so little, it's half of the pricing of the scooter placement. Um, another one that I actually I will be addressing during my talk next week is when I had little kids and we wanted to travel, I was always very, being a transportation engineer and knowing about safety, and that's the car crashes are the leading uh, death, uh, the reason for death among young children and ad young adults. I was very overly protective about the car seats and seat belts. And right. I remember trying to get a car seat uh, for one of my daughters, and that's not possible. So we ended up packing the car seat, putting it in the airplane. It was a whole ordeal. And then I remember uh, one of the right sourcing services started Uber Pets. So you can have a service to transport your pet, but you can't request a car seat. And it's also great that you have the Uber Pets service. I don't even know if it's still operating, um, but there was something like that when back when. Uh, but the car seat, that should be a priority of current policymakers to account right for our children and their safety and then pets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, you, you're, you're like, wait a minute. We're, you know, as you mentioned, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. We're, we're incentivizing a certain way of life. We're subsidizing a certain way of life and yet we're penalizing another. It's yeah. So it's, and that was one of the interesting things that that came about with the whole scooter revolution, the micro mobility thing that that emerged. And to your point, it, no, it's not okay that the micro mobility devo devices block the sidewalk and impede the ability for people in wheelchairs to be able to get around. But the overreaction of it relative to the real risk on our streets, you know, especially in North America, as you well know, is the speeding motor vehicles. And, and, and so it's just, it, it's amazing how from a behavioral perspective, what we all get worked up as, you know, on and about as a society. And, and, and so it's very, very interesting. I want to go back to um, that aspect of what it felt like when you finally made it on the ground there in TU Delft and in the city of Delft and and then compare that relative to what you've been studying because you, you, you've been looking at this from a behavioral perspective, from a econometrics perspective, and then suddenly you get thrust into uh, you know, an in-size of one, you, <laughs> and then four, your family, thrown into your own little uh, live experiment. Talk a little bit more about that. It felt in a way like I am forced to, to live my own research, which it made me really rethink things uh, because, and that's something I, I was actually considering uh, before, because when I was living in the US, I would go and visit my family in Poland and I would immediately put my kid in the back seat and started biking to the store. And I picked up on that behavioral change before, but it was rather subtle. Here, it was a shock. Um, here, I went from driving everywhere to not driving anywhere. Um, and I can 
tell you that it was much easier for me to adjust to go from being very car-centric to being car-free than the other way around when I moved from Europe to the U.S. Uh, that was much more different change uh, to all of a sudden become dependent on automobile. And the initial uh, weeks uh, were filled with surprises, and one of them was recycling. Uh, without a car, uh, you know, how do you put these boxes into those especially when you're moving and you order furniture, they come in big boxes. And then like, what do you do? So I had to get really creative here. Um, yeah. And then you have to bike them uh, into these little bins and those are underground containers and you drop them. But when you see the paper, the blue one is, is paper, it's rather small and you have a TV box and you have to break it. So it's another workout that you have to do. You have to break the entire box and then I don't either carry it or put it on your bike and hope it will not be all over the street and then put it into that uh, recycle container. And again, um, those are the behaviors that were not very obvious to me. I used to recycle. I tried to be container free, not buy products that like, you know, dry shampoo and stuff like that uh, without containers. But here it's like another level. Um, I thought I was like, you know, patting myself on the back in the US that, oh yeah, I bought a shampoo bar. Um, here I'm literally taking a um, container. If there's any food, I put it into compost because we put compost into compost every night. And then the plastic goes to plastic and metal. And then we have paper and then we have glass and then we have miscellaneous. Um, it got to the science. And I remember that was the finding moment of moving to Delft. I was standing, you know, that cheese separators that you have. Mm -hmm. And I was standing and calling my partner. I'm like, is it paper or it's plastic? Because it looks like paper, but you can't tear it. And uh, we both start laughing and, um, you know, it was... We were trying to bring some humor, but I was very stressed out about the whole uh, recycling. I feel like I'm getting it down to the science, but but it impacts my shopping behavior. Not yeah. only it impacts, and then I go to the store and I'm like, hmm, if I order on Amazon, it will come in a box and then I have to walk the box. So relieving my research and seeing how my behavioral changes after I experience uh, something has been truly uh accelerating for me as a researcher. And then, of course, I have a different opinion as a parent. I have a different op opinion as a woman. Uh, so I have all these different avenues in which I started to evaluate uh, transportation systems. Right, right. And uh, it, it's interesting how many times I've, I've had um, uh, guests on the, the podcast and we get around to the uh, trash collection. <laughs> theme, uh, especially in the Netherlands. And so uh, one of one of my favorite interviews ever is uh, Jason Slaughter with the, the YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes. And he has a fabulous video uh, about trash collection in the Netherlands. So I'll be sure to make sure that we've got a link to that video as well. It's well worth it. It's, it's fascinating how they accomplish this, especially when you see the nightmare of trash collection in New York City. It just, it, it boggles my mind how poorly they go about that, you know, here in, in North America. Uh, you know, certainly one of the things that we, we notice in many North American cities is that it's notorious that the recycling collection bins and the trash bins are inevitably, somehow, magically, always blocking the bike lanes. And so <laughs> it's just one of those little things that uh, is so special about how the Dutch have appreciated the complexity of the system and then have designed and engineered a, uh, a an approach to it that is you know very very uh, I, I want to say it's it's like a low impact on you know the environment and uh, and it's just brilliant so I'll leave it at that enough talk about trash I'll uh, make sure we have the link to uh, Jason's wonderful video about trash collection in the Netherlands it's good stuff uh, I'm glad you mentioned that though <laughs> that we were able to to pull up this image because you did send me this and say we got to talk yeah. about this <laughs> and as a as a fun fact uh, at TU Delft we don't even have trash bins in our offices 
And uh-huh. initially I was like, oh, that's not ideal. But now I'm seeing every time I have to throw something out, I have to go to the hallway. And we, of course, have different uh, bins for different things. And it gives me the activity that you need from sitting all day, which I actually find a good thing. Because if I had a, a trash can in my office, I would just throw it there. But now I have to walk to the end of the hallway. So again, it stimulates activity. I feel like here every time um, there is a purpose that you get up and move. And I, I do appreciate that. But again, I maybe just, um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird like that. But I love that need <laughs> that forces me to move uh, as opposed to sit still for eight hours. Well, here's a here's your uh, post from yesterday where you're you're saying bikes are like best friends. They broaden your horizon and move you forward without consuming unnecessary energy. And I know energy is one of those things that you're that you're constantly thinking about. And uh, I, I'm I'm sure that you weren't thinking about energy in the context of climate change with this particular post. But I did. Uh, this is oh okay. There you go. <laughs> It's beautiful. And uh, I, I can't think of a better way for us to you know, sort of pause and say, is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you, you, you'd like to make sure that we uh, leave the audience with? No, I think we covered it all. And thanks uh, so much to anyone for tuning in. Uh, thanks for having me. It was really, really fun. And actually, you can tell our time difference right now because it got dark on my end. Uh, and you're starting your day. So I'm glad we were able to do it. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, impinging on your your family time at this point. You're getting into the evening, and yes, it's midday for me. And I I can't tell you how grateful I am for for you joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 101 of the Active Towns podcast. I sure hope you enjoyed this chat with Dr. Natalia Barber as much as I did. I am so inspired and encouraged by the important work she is doing, and I seriously can't wait to connect with her one day in person in Delft. To learn more about her research and to follow her on Twitter, be sure to check out the links in the show notes and more importantly on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this week's episode, but before I let you go, I hope you will consider helping me to grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation, spreading the word, and subscribing. Thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.